On behalf of the Boston University Students for Justice in Palestine, I would like to thank you all for coming to this very important and exciting event. Both speakers we have today are experts on Israel-Palestine and are currently co-authoring a book titled How to Solve the Israel-Palestine Conflict, which will be out in February. This is their first public appearance together, and they're, they're, they will be taking their, your questions at the end. Um, the first speaker is a renowned political scientist, author, activist, and lecturer who is an expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict and a proponent of Palestinian rights. He has written extensively on issues relating to the conflict and has authored several books relating to this issue. He has also appeared on many media outlets in the past. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Norman Finkelstein. Well, thank you for coming out this evening. And by good fortune for myself, and I think especially good fortune for you, the audience, by coincidence, uh, my co-author, who I only get to see once every several years, he happened to be in Boston at the same time as me, which is tonight. And a few months ago, we decided that maybe now was the time to not only talk about the awful things that have been happening in Israel-Palestine, but there may actually be the opportunity now to talk about how, for once and for all, to resolve the conflict and to put it behind us. And so I suggested to him, and I was grateful that he agreed, first of all, to write a short book with myself under the modest title, How to Solve the Israel-Palestine Conflict. And then tonight, he was just speaking at the Harvard Kennedy School, and he uh, graciously agreed to come over and do, as it were, a test run uh, of what we're going to be proposing. And I have to say a lot of what he'll be saying tonight will also be of great interest to me because um, I'm not sure exactly what he will be proposing. <laughs> but I think we're on the same page. Uh, the he I'm referring to is Muin Rabani, and without trying to flatter him and sticking strictly to the facts, I do think, and here I'm not being facetious, he's the shrewdest uh, political analyst on the Israel-Palestine conflict in the world today. There's just nobody who even approaches him in knowledge, in perceptiveness, uh, and I'm, as I say, I'm not just saying that. That's why I wanted him to co-author the book. And I said all along to my publisher, if he's not the co-author, I can't do it because he knows what he's talking about and he's also very sensible. I can't go through his whole history. I know he attended, because I don't know it actually, but uh, what I do know is he did attend <laughs> Tufts University he then spent some time at Georgetown, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he then worked, uh, well actually, to his greatest credit, uh, he was the first executive director of Al Haq. No, researcher. Uh, researcher at Al Haq, which was the main Palestinian human rights organization, which was very active during the first Intifada, uh, the years 1987 to 1993. And that was roughly the period I first got to know Muin. In more recent times, he headed up the Palestine desk for the International Crisis Group. Uh, and now he's a fairly uh, pervasive presence in the Arab media, in particular, analyzing the Israel-Palestine conflict. For those of you who follow Al Jazeera Arabic. He's quite frequently on. And um, he's also writing. And he'll be the first speaker. Just the order of presentation this evening. Muin will be 
setting out the general picture, not just as current events, but more importantly, why the current political situation allows for the possibility, if not the certainty, at any rate the possibility for actually resolving the conflict. I will then try to suggest what should be the goal that we set for resolving the conflict. And then Muin will address within the context of the goal that we set, he will address the question of the refugees and I will address the question of the settlements. And once that is done, it will be an opportunity for everybody here to also step in and have their say, uh, whether in the form of a statement or questions. So having said that, uh, here's Muin. Uh, thank you, Norm. You did set the bar very low. Uh, just one uh, small correction. I haven't appeared on uh, Al Jazeera Arabic. I don't do live interviews in, in Arabic because of uh, insufficient mastery of the language. Um, I've done some uh, pre-recorded because those can always be edited and corrected. But um, anyway, um, what I'd like to uh, discuss this evening is basically looking at where the region is today and where it might be heading, um, where the Palestinians are today and where they might be heading, and um, by way of conclusion, what that may, could, and hopefully can mean um, uh, for the future of uh, the Palestinian people and a potential resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian and broader Arab-Israeli conflict. I suppose the obvious place to start is by saying um, that the region is in a state of um, unprecedented uh, transformation, um, a revolutionary moment that uh, we haven't experienced uh, since 1958 and that may well in the months and years ahead develop into um, an Arab 1848. Uh, like 1848, it's, it's not something that's going to bring um, uh, immediate or immediately positive uh, results, but sets and train the prospect of, of, of a transformation, of a fundamental transformation of uh, the constitutional order, of the political order, of uh, social and economic order in the region. Uh, with the possibility of a um, more bearable uh, future for the peoples of the region and for their rights. Now, within this, this transformation, which I probably don't need to describe in too much detail for you, uh, because I suspect many of you have been following it on, on, on your um, television screens and elsewhere, the extraordinary scenes of the popular uprising uh, first in Tunisia against um, an autocrat and dictator who many of us expected to last in power for at least several lifetimes. Um, and then in Egypt, uh, ousting a dictator who was going to remain in power for a second lifetime through the agency of his son and now, as we've seen elsewhere in the region, um, throughout the region really, from uh, Morocco in the west to Oman in the east. Within, within this transformation, which is characterized, um, uh, let's say, not by military coups and, 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 and um, conspiracies within and among the elite, but has been fundamentally characterized by uh, people's taking to the streets, um, uh, breaking through the barrier of fear, and challenging, um, uh, challenging their leaders and their intelligence agencies, and even in cases, their armies, often 
with nothing more than bare hands that hold uh, nothing more than banners with slogans. Within this context, we've also begun to see, I think, real changes in, um, in the Palestinian arena. To take a step back, um, uh, the Palestine question since the early 1990s has been dominated by what's conventionally known as the peace process. This began in Madrid in, uh, at the end of uh, 1991, metamorphosed into the Oslo process, in the Oslo framework, uh, in September of, of 1993. And um, if there's one way to characterize it, it would be that the previous framework of dealing with the Palestine question, which was one in which Palestinians sought to achieve the right of national self-determination on the basis of um, inalienable rights guaranteed to them by uh, UN resolutions and international law, was transformed into a framework where the Palestinian people were basically transformed into a hamster um, running in the wheel uh, and never catching the bait. It was one where Palestinians had to prove their worthiness, not even for rights, but even you know, for um, uh, basic uh, interests like getting, for example, tax transfers um, that were already guaranteed to them according to various um, uh, treaties that they had signed by Israel, but which could, could be either um, uh, given or withheld at will almost by royal prerogative. But we had, a, we had basically a different framework emerging um, in, which, in which Palestinians were placed in the position that they had to consistently, ceaselessly demonstrate that they were eligible for crumbs from the table. These were crumbs that were um, uh, thrown by the Israelis, but more importantly, there was the all-powerful American arbiter um, uh, standing in the room who would determine uh, when, where, and how um, uh, uh, the Israelis uh, should be throwing uh, yet another crumb to the Palestinians. So we had a period of, of two decades of what was conventionally known as, as the peace process, but which I think is more appropriately termed the consolidation of Israeli occupation on the basis of an ever deepening process of Palestinian fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation most notably geographically in which um, uh, the Palestinian authority areas were uh, and each were individually encircled and separated by areas of exclusive uh, control. We had most notably um, uh, the fragmentation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, whereas until the early 1990s, one could get into a car um, in the northern West Bank and uh, without too much difficulty drive to the southern Gaza Strip, uh, that became simply impossible. And it became simply impossible in the context of the peace process. And then, of course, also the separation of the West Bank from East Jerusalem, leading to the gradual atrophy of, uh, of East Jerusalem, because it's a, um, a city that is not viable except on the basis of its organic connection to the rest of the West Bank, and that's something uh, that was severed. Now, what, what we saw in, in the past several years was not only continuing exponential um, expansion of Israeli settlements and so on, uh, but growing doubts that a two-state settlement, which was the supposed objective of the Oslo uh, framework that it ever could be achieved. And the reason is that there were basically, there were three preconditions um, uh, for a su successful outcome. 
first of all, you would need sufficient international and particularly American pressure um, on Israel to disgorge the occupied territories. Secondly, you would need an Israeli leadership that was capable of uh, surviving a decision to withdraw from the occupied territories. Uh, and third of all, you would need um, uh, an Israeli capability to actually implement such a decision without, for example, uh, bringing on a military rebellion on its hands. Now, when people look at the rightward shift in Israeli uh, society, uh, the prospects of very widespread insubordination in the ranks of the Israeli military if an order to withdraw from the West Bank would be given and so on, people increasingly concluded that in, in, in the absence not only of American pressure but even the prospect of American pressure on Israel, um, and the absence of an Israeli government that seemed capable of ever taking a decision to withdraw from the occupied territories, that the days of a two-state settlement were numbered. And I think one need only look at the map uh, to realize why people were increasingly concluding either that a two-state settlement was past tense or that that moment was very rapidly approaching. Having said that, and having myself been one of those um, who was also coming to that conclusion in recent years, I have to say um, uh, uh, that the developments over the past year in the region, but also in the Palestinian arena, give real cause for reconsideration and give cause for um, renewed belief that a two-state settlement, a genuine two-state settlement, not you know the, the Bantustan plus scenario that had been uh, proposed that, that could be achieved. And here, I think it makes sense to start also by looking at um, the, the initiative by the Palestinian leadership to go to the United Nations uh, last September. Now, the background to this has to do with um, uh, the assumption of office of the Obama administration in January 2009 and the belief among the Palestinian leadership that uh, salvation was at most just around the corner. Uh, Obama in his electoral campaign had repeatedly spoken of the need to um, have a fundamentally different relationship with the Muslim world after the Bush years and had indicated that he saw um, uh, the need to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as, as central to that changed relationship. He, of, he appointed a Mideast envoy, I think within 36 hours of, of, of taking office, rather than, and, and seemed to be different not only from Bush, but even from Clinton, who waited until the waning days of, of his uh, second term to uh, engage seriously with this conflict. And there were other signals that to the Palestinian or to the Palestinian leadership indicated that things were now going to be different, um, not realizing that the most that could be expected under an Obama administration was a revival of the Oslo process, a process that was all about process and not about peace, in which actually the things that have been uh, seen and denounced as violations of Oslo were not violations of Oslo. Consolidation of, of, of uh, occupation, settlement expansion, and so on. Oslo was designed uh, for these things, and, and there could not be another outcome. So if we fast forward a year, we see um, a situation in which uh, Obama, um, uh, having initially been seen as, as, as a, almost a Jesus-like savior uh, by elements of the Palestinian leadership, was increasingly seen as, as more of a Judas uh, by increasing segments of, of Palestinian society. And dealing with the process as he proposed it was really one disappointment after, after another. At the same time, the Palestinians were also dealing with their abiding schism uh, between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, where you had one part of 
the Palestinian national movement, uh, the Hamas movement exercising hegemony over the Gaza Strip, and another uh, Fatah exercising hegemony over the West Bank under overall Israeli control. And um, uh, the leadership in the West Bank felt increasing pressure to do something, to seek an achievement in the context of these uh, internal rivalries. Uh, the third element, of course, was the regional transformation that placed enormous pressure on the Palestinian leadership to break with, uh, with business as, as usual because uh, not only their credibility but their very legitimacy was being called into question. This also had to do with, for example, the collusion of this leadership uh, during the Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip in, at the end of 2008 and early 2009, the way that um, the leadership had undermined um, uh, the Goldstone uh, report at the Human Rights Commission and so on. So out of this kind of cauldron of disappointment, frustration, popular pressures, um, uh, and demands for action, came the idea of uh, submitting, of going back to the United Nations. Uh, the first sign of this was in February of this year when the uh, Palestinian leadership went to the Security Council to seek a, um, uh, a resolution condemning further Israeli settlement expansion. Uh, amazingly, they didn't think that the U.S. would veto it. They genuinely believed that in the context of, these, uh, of the regional upheaval, uh, Washington would be very wary of vetoing such a resolution, particularly because the text of the resolution was basically a cut and paste job from official American statements. Nevertheless, the U.S. did veto the resolution, as, as might be expected, and this was, I think, for many seen as kind of a death blow um, uh, to the prospects of a revival of um, uh, meaningful negotiations with a meaningful agenda. And we then, over the summer, saw a growing um, uh, move to go towards the United Nations to seek full Palestinian membership in the UN. Now, I think it's important to point out that, unfortunately, this was not done as part of any coherent strategy. Um, there were no real preparations. So, for example, at the end of the day, uh, the Palestinian leadership decided to go to the Security Council rather than the General Assembly. But what we saw is that efforts to lobby the individual Security Council members began not six months before submitting uh, the application, but several days or, or weeks after. And this has to do with kind of the haphazard pattern of, of policy making of that section of, of the Palestinian leadership that undertook um, uh, this, this initiative. Nevertheless, I think the key issue here is, or there are two issues here. The first is that seen from the perspective of those who sponsored the initiative at the UN, internationalizing the question of Palestine and moving away decisively away from the Oslo process was never on their agenda. Rather, they were seeking to give the Oslo framework uh, what you might call um, electric shock therapy, hoping that this would serve as a wake-up call to the Obama administration, in exchange for which um, the, the Americans would either, um, uh, that they would offer something in return, you know, it's kind of one of these hold me back uh, before I kill him uh, kind of things. Um, and it simply didn't work. The Americans turned around and kicked the Palestinians in the teeth. They said they would veto it. Uh, they said that the Palestinians would get nothing in return. And if you look at the statement that the uh, quartet gave after, um, uh, the, after the UN, after the Palestinian application was submitted to the Security Council, it proposed a new framework for negotiations that was actually significantly worse than what the Quartet had proposed in previous instances, and that's quite an achievement. Um, nevertheless, I think the more important point is that um, the, uh, 
the move towards the UN has set in motion agendas and processes which have developed beyond the control of those uh, sponsoring that initiative. I think simply by having gone to the UN, uh, the, the leadership has made it impossible to now return to the negotiating table in the absence of a clear and credible agenda for ending the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip and, and East Jerusalem. Uh, they simply cannot go back to the negotiating table and survive. It would be political suicide for them. Um, uh, secondly, I think it is, however inadvertently, uh, the beginning of the renewed internationalization of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In other words, it's the beginning of a new process whereby the framework for addressing and resolving this conflict is UN resolutions and international law, uh, rather than basically um, uh, American officials determining what Palestinians can and can't have based on the process of Israeli um, needs and interests to the total exclusion of, of uh, Palestinian rights. Um, this, is going, this is not going to happen overnight, but I think this move by the Palestinians represents a decisive, the beginnings of a decisive break with the Oslo process, which can only be for the good. I think it's also the beginnings of the end of the quartet. Now, for those of you who were unfamiliar with the quartet, the quartet was established by the Bush administration in 2002, basically as a substitute um, uh, for the international community, as a substitute for the United Nations, more or less. And um, for the past eight, nine years, the quartet has represented itself, has presented itself as representing the will of the international community. Yet, if we see what has actually happened at the UN in the past few months, it's become clear to everyone that, there's that, that the positions of the quartet and that of the planet are actually diametrically opposed. Um, uh, and that they don't complement each other in the least. And, and thus far, at least, uh, the Palestinians have refused to significantly re-engage with the quartet on, on Tony Blair's terms. Um, by way of conclusion, I'd, I'd just like to say a few words about what might be next. I think, at least for Palestinians, the absolute precondition um, uh, for being able to get any ad advantage out of the current situation, whether these changes in Palestinian strategy, uh, which I've been discussing, or, or the regional transformation, the absolute precondition is Palestinian national reconciliation, uh, basically a revived Palestinian national movement on the basis of a um, uh, partnership between the key Palestinian organizations, primarily, of course, uh, Fatah and Hamas, but also others, including um, uh, not only um, political movements, but also uh, um, core constituencies that have, over the course of the past two decades, been completely marginalized in the context of the Oslo process. I'm here thinking primarily of the Palestinian diaspora, um, but also the um, Palestinian community within um, uh, the Green Line. Now, this has to be done on the basis of a common political program. And um, the common political program that has been all but agreed between these various factions is a, um, uh, a two-state settlement based on uh, relevant UN resolutions and international law. Next, um, uh, the Palestinians will need to develop a coherent strategy. As we've seen in the past few months, you can't simply go to the UN and throw in an application and expect uh, any results from it within a matter of, 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 of days or weeks or even months. Um, 
it has to be embedded in a coherent strategy which, which involves um, preparation, discipline, commitment, but also, and perhaps most importantly, mobilization. Um, uh, the Palestinian people, not only the Palestinian people need to be mobilized, but especially now that, that in a sense, the, the, the will of the Arab people is being unleashed by these regional transformations, um, Arab solidarity needs to be mobilized. And last but by no means least, um, international solidarity needs to be mobilized. We've seen, if you look at Europe, for example, there's been a fundamental transformation over the course of the past two decades. We previously used to have a situation in Europe where governments were, to one extent or another, rather neutral um, on this, on this uh, issue, but uh, European public opinion tended to be strongly pro-Israeli. Well, the situation now is, is opposite. I mean, in, for many sectors of European public opinion, Israel has become more or less a dirty word. Um, uh, yet, what we've seen it during the same period is that government, European governments have become increasingly uh, pro-Israeli. But there's a lot of work to do here in the sense that um, there's a lot of activism by Palestinians and um, uh, solidarity activists on, on this issue. And uh, it has achieved results, but one need only think of how much greater the results of such activism would be if it was actually sponsored and supported by a genuinely representative uh, national uh, leadership. I mean, you know, one could think of how much longer uh, the South Africans would have had to struggle if, for example, the divestment campaign was not actively supported by the ANC um, uh, during, during the 1980s. So, um, just to sum up, my last point, the region now is at a critical historical juncture. I think the most important impact of this transformation is that it has, for the first time in decades, um, renewed possibility. Uh, it's very difficult to tell where things are going to end up, but I think it's equally true um, that it's not foreordained, that human agency plays a key role here. And how people seek, uh, how people seek to influence these changes and play a role in these changes will, I think, be fundamental uh, to where these changes will end up. Thank you. Well, I want to resume where Muin left off, uh, in particular on two points. I'll begin with the last one, which is, as Muin said, you don't know where things are headed. It's a moment which is pregnant with possibility, but it could all be aborted very quickly. It may last for years, or it may even turn into just a fleeting moment. We really don't know. And that's all the more reason why we have to concentrate our energy now. Because if you miss a historical moment, then you miss a huge historic, a huge historic possibility. And then the conflict can just drag on and on and on and on. And so we have to do all in our power to capitalize on that moment, which for all we know might not last all that long. Now having said that, Muin also remarked that as promising as possibilities might be, he said that it has to be embedded in a strategy. You can't carry on in a random, unfocused fashion. 
there has to be a strategy. And as he said, one of the aspects of the strategy is to mobilize people. That's the goal, to reach out to a public, not only in Europe, but a public even in the United States that the first time in living memory is ready to listen. If you look at the polls, not just in Europe, but also in North America, Israel's stock has significantly declined. I wouldn't say as in Europe, it's plummeted, and it has in Europe consistently in polls taken by the BBC World Service, Israel over the last 10 years has been consistently, if we can use the word, lumped together with Iran, Pakistan, and North Korea as having the most negative influence in the world, in every country in Europe, virtually every country in Europe. It's not true that public opinion has become so hostile to Israel and the United States. But it is true that public opinion has significantly changed. So to take the most recent example, two polls were taken, one by Pew, one by the BBC, both are very reputable polling agencies. Two polls were taken on the attitudes among many countries, including the United States, on the question of Palestinian statehood. Now, of the countries polled, every single one, bar none, in every single country polled, either a plurality or a majority supported Palestinian statehood. That's not altogether surprising, except that when I say every single country polled, surprisingly, that included the United States, where a plurality, approximately 45% of Americans said they supported the Palestinian bid for statehood, and depending on the poll, 24 or 36% opposed it. Now you have to appreciate, as only an American can, how remarkable that is. Because the President of the United States, Mr. Obama, was dead set against Palestinian statehood. Both houses of Congress passed resolutions condemning Palestinian statehood. Both political parties condemned Palestinian statehood and the full gamut of the mainstream media opposed Palestinian statehood. Nonetheless, a plurality of Americans managed to see through the lies, see through the misinformation and disinformation, and supported its statehood. And you can cite many other polls which give similar indication that public opinion in the U.S. is changing. And not just among Americans in general, but public opinion among American Jews in particular. It's also significantly changed. And for reasons which are fairly obvious on a moment's reflection. Because American Jews are overwhelmingly liberal. Since at least the 1930s, American Jews have overwhelmingly voted for the Democratic Party. And on all polls that are taken, American Jews define themselves on the spectrum of conservative, moderate, liberal. American Jews define themselves in percentages as liberal much higher than any other ethnic or religious group in the United States. If you look at the last presidential election, 80% of American Jews voted for Barack Obama. Latinos 
who came in third, first African Americans, who was over 90 percent, American Jews, 80 percent, Latinos, it was about 63 percent voted for Mr. Obama. Now, if you factor in income, American Jews now being by far and away the wealthiest religious ethnic group in the U.S., they should be voting Republican if you vote by your pocketbook, as most people do. But no, American Jews are liberal. They vote Democratic. And liberal in the United States it generally means belief in the rule of law, belief in equality before the law, belief in international institutions, <clears throat> belief in the peaceful resolution of, of a conflict. That's what liberal means in the American context. And the simple fact is American Jews now know too much they can no longer reconcile their liberal convictions, their liberal tenets, their liberal beliefs with the way Israel carries on. It's simply not possible any longer to reconcile. And it's particularly true among young American Jews, those who attend schools like Boston University, where you're young, you're Jewish, you're idealistic, you're liberal, which is the profile, overwhelmingly, of college-age college, uh, American Jews. Young, liberal, idealistic. Well, if you fit that profile, as most American Jewish college students do. You don't want to have to go before the public. In 2006, during the Israeli attack on Lebanon, they dropped in the last 72 hours of the war, when a UN resolution had already been passed and the ceasefire was supposed to go into effect. And Israel used the last 72 hours to drop 4 million, 4 million cluster bomblets on South Lebanon. You're young, you're Jewish, you're liberal, you're idealistic. You don't want to defend that. You're young, you're Jewish, you're liberal, you're idealistic. During Israel's invasion of Gaza in 2008-9, they dropped white phosphorus, a substance that reaches 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. They dropped it in two hospitals. They're Jewish. You don't want to have to defend that. If you're Rush Limbaugh's son, Sarah Palin's daughter, <laughs> Michelle Bachman's whatever, <laughs> is she still around? <laughs> Kane is getting all the headlines now, so I know. Uh, if you're them, yeah, you'll defend it. You know, some people will defend breaking the kneecaps of nuns, but it's not a Jewish thing. And so all the polls show that there has been a steady decline in American Jewish support for Israel and among young, younger Jews, ages 40 and under, uh, there has been a significant decline, so much so that there's a, a vast amount of literature now talking about how to, among the Jewish community, talking about how to reverse this significant decline. And you can see that work in the universities, uh, even in, in your own school. There was a time when Israel IDF soldiers 
used to tour the universities to be celebrated, in particular by the Jewish students, as war heroes. But in more recent years, the college Hillels, they, dry, they drag the IDF soldiers on tours, but the, pur the purpose of the tours is to try to convince Jewish students that they aren't war criminals. It's changed. And Israel and its propaganda outfits and its lobby, they know the battle has been lost. And that's why they desperately work behind the scenes to try to get events like this one canceled because they know they cannot any longer win the battle for public opinion. They have lost in the court of public opinion. And so they work behind the scenes making all sorts of threats about withholding alumni funds and feeling unsafe when this or that speaker comes. All of these kinds of petty, silly tactics in order to suppress any open discussion because they know in any open discussion it's a lost cause. They've lost. And so now we have the opportunity of trying to build a movement, trying, as Muin said, to develop a strategy, develop goals, and, as he said, mobilize people to try for once and for all to put this conflict behind us. Because a kind of sentiment has settled in that this thing will never end. And I think there is an opportunity now, and we have to change our mindset. The mindset which we've had for decades now, and regrettably, I have to say decades now, that mindset needs to be changed. I see Susan Akram in the audience, who I first met, I'm afraid to say, about 30 years we're heading. How, how, where are we now? 21 years ago. <laughs> Maureen, it's, we're coming on 30 years, because I think it was about 85, right? Yeah. And it's sort of like, it's going to just continue on and on and on. But I think now there is a possibility to reach a resolution and turn the Israel-Palestine conflict not into a subject of current events, but a subject of history, a past event. And we really have to believe that not as an act of faith, but believe it because there are new possibilities. And then the question is, okay, what's the strategy? How do you mobilize people? And here it seems to me a useful person to look at to provide some insight and guidance uh, is to look at the Mahatma, Mr. Gandhi, because he faced a challenge not unlike the one the Palestinians confront. India was trying to end an occupation, and the occupation was by the most formidable military and economic and political power of its day, namely the British. And the Palestinians are also trying to end an occupation. 
and of the immediate adversary is a regional power, the overarching adversary is the leading political economic uh, power of our day, namely the United States. So, how do you, how do you begin? What do you do? Well, I did take some time a couple of years ago to plow through a large part of Mr. Gandhi's collected works, which are quite substantial. They run to a hundred and a hundred volumes, uh, 500 pages a volume. Gandhi had a lot to say. In fact, not, not mostly about politics in a narrow sense. Most of his collected works are given over to uh, diet and health. He was a kind of a premature Oprah, but with a rather narrower waistline. <laughs> and don't let the pictures in the cover for a magazine fool you. It's a miracle what you can do with the angle on lenses. Uh, <laughs> in any event, I did go through his, a large part of his collected works, and I think he had a lot of quite useful insight, some of which bears directly on the topic of my part of this evening's lecture. And the most important insight, I think, from Gandhi was that politics is not about trying to change public opinion. You're not trying to bring enlightenment to the benighted masses. Politics is about trying to get people to act on what they already know is wrong. And everybody has that experience. You get up in the morning, and from the moment the day begins to the moment the day ends, you look around you, that's wrong. That's just not right. That's unfair. That shouldn't be. There are a thousand things that we already know are wrong, but we don't act on them, including myself. And for Gandhi, the art of politics is to stimulate people to act on what they already know is wrong. The purpose of nonviolent civil disobedience was trying, as he called it, to quicken the conscience, to quicken the conscience, the dead conscience of the public into action. So I see that Susan has a perplexed look in her eyes, and I do try to give concrete examples because abstractions rarely um, have an impact. So, concretely, what does that mean? Well, I go jogging in my neighborhood, and there's an overpass along the boulevard. And underneath the overpass, every winter, there are always Mexican workers sleeping there. And every time I pass them, Every time I make a resolution, it must be at least a decade now, I make the resolution, I'm going to give them one of my winter coats because they're buried underneath these raggedy, dirty blankets. And as it happens, I have a closet full of winter coats. I have one going all the way back to when I was 16. It was a mighty Mac. And it was a mighty good winter coat, which is why I've kept it. Do you remember the Mighty Mac? No, the other people won't remember. You, I'm asking. Do you remember it? No. Okay. <laughs> You're obviously not from the United States. You're an alien. Uh, well, I have all these old winter coats, but as many times as I resolve, I'm going to give them a winter coat. I just never do. I never 
follow up on what I know is wrong. Now I know, knowing me, that were it the case that 30 or 40 people were to block the boulevard where I live, and we're saying we're committing this act of nonviolent civil disobedience to try to shake the conscience of people, to remind them there are all these homeless people who are in these frigid temperatures and they need coats. And if somebody were to do that, or some people were to do that, I know I'd be the first one out there carrying not one, but at least five of my winter coats and giving them to the homeless. And that's what Gandhi said politics is about, trying to get people to act on what they already know is wrong. But there's one qualification. The qualification is that not only must your means be just, that is, nobody can find exception to using nonviolent civil disobedience, not only must your means be just, but in the public's eye, in the public's eye, your goal also has to be just. If they don't agree with your goal, then however just your means are, you will never get people to act. So what does that mean concretely? Well, let's take the case of the United States. Most public opinion polls show the Americans are divided right down the middle on the question of abortion. 50% are pro-choice, 50% are pro-life. So, let's just imagine doing a thought experiment. If the 50% of Americans who are pro-life, all of them were to converge on the abortion clinics in the United States, and they said, we are going to fast unto the death until these physicians stop performing abortions. Their means, no reasonable person can quarrel with. They are absolutely nonviolent and they entail the maximum in personal sacrifice. But if I were to ask, are you pro-choice? No, the woman in front of you, yes. So if I were to ask you, if these people said they were gonna fast unto the death, until these abortions stop, would that move you? No. And she shakes her head emphatically, no. Of course not. She's probably thinking, I hope they fast until the death, and I hope they drop dead. <laughs> Which tells you that it's not just just means that will reach a public, it's also just ends, goals. And so in order to try as Muin said, to set a strategy that mobilizes people, we have to be very careful that we set ourselves a goal that will reach people. If you overreach in your goal, you're going to lose people. And if you overreach in your goal, instead of creating a movement, you're simply going to build a cult. Instead of building a movement, you're going to end up creating a cult. The two are very different. Mr. Gandhi, most of you know his political life, 
as a leader of the Indian independence movement, but he had a second simultaneous life. He was an ashram leader. And in his ashram, which is like a cult, in his ashram he was very strict. He was a very strict taskmaster. No meat, obviously, because he's a vegetarian. No sex, brahmacharya. But no underwear. He thought that was a Western idea. No joking while doing chores. No reading in the toilet. No wrist watches. And he enforced this on every member of his ashram. And he used to have them keep a book. What do you do every minute of every day? Because he thought there was nothing more sinful than squandering time. And he would read the book. He was a little big brother. But Gandhi was smart and shrewd enough a politician to recognize that you couldn't use the standard of an ashram if you want to build a mass movement among the Indian people. It's a different standard. Having said that, what should be the standard of the Palestine movement? And here I think the answer is very straightforward and uncontroversial. Because if you look at every representative body in the world today, every representative political body in the world today, or if you look at the most respected political bodies in the world today, whichever angle you look at it, from the most representative to the most respected, you come to the same conclusion. The whole of international public opinion in its most democratic and its most progressive forums, they've embraced the two-state settlement on the June 1967 border, a full Israeli withdrawal from the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, including, in the case of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and what's called a just resolution of the refugee question. So, because time is limited, let's just take a couple of examples. So if I were to ask you what's the most representative political body in the world today, you would say, yeah, the United Nations General Assembly. And every year the UN General Assembly votes in a resolution titled Peaceful Resolution of the Palestine Question. Actually, it votes literally this minute every year the end of November. I'm not sure what the vote is this year. It usually comes out in early December. In any case, they vote on a two-state settlement, full Israeli withdrawal, just settlement, of the just settlement of the Palestinian refugee question, to give you the typical votes across the past decade. 1997, the vote, 155 to 2, the whole world on one side, Israel and the United States on the other side. 2004, the vote, 161 to 7, the whole world on one side, Israel, the US, Australia, Grenada, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau on the other side. 2010, this past year, the vote, 165 to 7, the whole world on one side, Israel, the United States, Australia, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau on the other side. 
For those of you who are laughing, and I know that sound of the embarrassed laughter, you hear Naru and Palau, funny names, but you don't know what they are, and you're college educated, so you're a little bit embarrassed. Uh, truth be told, I didn't know much about them either. Uh, I can tell you without trying to disparage small countries that their entire populations can easily fit in the empty seats in this room with room left over. And also in the case of these uh, countries, uh, because of global warming, uh, they probably will not be voting in many more of these <laughs> UN. No, that's not, you shouldn't be applauding that. It's, uh, some of you are thinking, but what about those Arab countries, those terrible, anti-Semitic, crazy, fanatical Arab countries? And yes, there are 22 of those countries in the world that belong to this organization called the Arab League. And the Arab League, in March 2002, it put forth what's come to be called the Arab Peace Initiative, and the Arab Peace Initiative says we support a two-state settlement in the June 1967 border, a, P a just resolution of the refugee question, echoing the sentiment of the United Nations General Assembly. Then some of you are thinking, what about those Muslim countries? And indeed, there are 57 Muslim countries. They belong to the Organization of the Islamic Conference, and the Organization of the Islamic Conference, it too adopted the Arab Peace Initiative supporting a two-state settlement in the June 67 border, just resolution of the refugee question. And it's important to bear in mind that among the members of the OIC, those 57 Muslim countries, is the Islamic Republic of Iran, which has supported the two-state settlement on the June 67 border and the just resolution of the refugee question, and since 2004, if you look at the UN General Assembly vote, and I urge you to do so on your own, it's the resolution I'll repeat is entitled Peaceful Settlement of the Palestine Question. You'll see Iran since 2004 has been voting with the majority, voting with the rest of the world, apart from the US, Israel, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau. If that's the most representative body in the world, then if I were to ask what is the most excuse, respected legal body in the world, you would respond? Well, ask Susan, because she teaches law. <laughs> the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice, consisting of 15 judges uh, from representative countries in the world. And in fact, the International Court of Justice in 2004 it rendered what's called an advisory opinion on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I don't have time now to go through the context of the opinion it rendered, but let me go through very quickly some of the substantive results of their opinion, which are relevant to this. Number one, the International Court of Justice ruled that the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, these are occupied Palestinian territories. These are the areas which, as the court put it, are designated for Palestinian self-determination. Number two, the International Court of Justice ruled that East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. It is exactly in its legal status the same as the West Bank and Gaza. It is a part of the designated unit for Palestinian self-determination. Number three, the International Court of Justice ruled that all the settlements are illegal, on, all the Jewish settlements in the occupied ter Palestinian territories, all 500,000 settlers, they are all illegal under international law. They are a flagrant violation of international law. Now bear in mind what that means. Because every time you open the newspaper or you turn on the radio and then you listen to the dreadful NPR or the dreadful BBC, they always refer to the occupied territories as 
the disputed territories. But according to the highest judicial body in the world, there's no dispute whatsoever. These are occupied Palestinian territories. If you listen to the radio, read the newspaper, they'll tell you that the settlements are controversial. But in fact, there's no controversy whatsoever about the legal status of those settlements. None at all. All the settlements under international law are, are illegal under international law. Now, I want to give you some sense about how lacking in controversy these issues are. We're told settlements, Jerusalem, borders, and I'll get to in a moment, the refugees were told these are such controversial issues that they have to be put off, put off deferred to the end of negotiations because they're so controversial that negotiations will break down if we start talking about them immediately. They're called the final status issues or sometimes the permanent status issues. Controversial? Well, let's look at that court opinion. There are 15 judges in that court. Two of them, incidentally, are Jewish. Rosalind Higgins from the UK, she's married to an Irishman, and Thomas Bergenfell, the American judge, who's a Holocaust survivor and Jewish. On the points to which I just referred, borders, Jerusalem, settlements, not a single judge, not one, on the International Court of Justice registered a dissent. Not one. On the broader issue that the court was addressing, which I can't get into now, the legality of the wall that Israel is building in the West Bank, the vote was 14 to 1. The negative vote was cast by the American judge, Bergenfeld. But even Bergenfeld said in his um, opinion, he wrote a separate opinion, not a dissent, he wrote a separate opinion. Even Bergenfeld said in his separate opinion, there's much in what the majority said that I agree with. And he said, I have to agree with the majority that the settlements are illegal under international law. There was no controversy. For those of you who follow the International Court of, Ju uh, International Court of Justice, it's very unusual. These are very independent-minded, you could say contentious judges. But when it came to these issues, there was no dissent and there was no dissent because there's nothing controversial at all about them in the law. They are just very straightforward issues of law. And that leaves the last question, the question of the refugees. Now it's true that the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, didn't address it because it wasn't relevant to what they were uh, adjudicating, but the major human rights organizations have addressed it. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, in 2000 to 2001, they issued opinion papers and policy statements on the question of the refugees. And both Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, they both agreed that under international law, the Palestinians and what they called their terms, succeeding gen uh, res uh, generations that have maintained genuine links with the land, the original Palestinian refugees, and succeeding, gen uh, succeeding generations that have maintained genuine links with the land, that they have the right of return. So there are two conclusions that follow from what I have to say. The first conclusion is, that this is the consensus of international opinion, both in its most representative and its respected bodies. This is where international opinion is at. 
It calls for a two-state settlement of the Israel-Palestine conflict on this June 67 border and the just resolution of the refugee question. The first conclusion is, on every significant issue, on every significant issue bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict, the Israeli position has no standing whatsoever. They have lost in the court of public opinion. Their position has been repudiated across the board. That is, you might say, the bright side of the picture. There is a broad public that's ready to hear a simple message. The message is enforce the law. That's what we want to do. We want to enforce the law. But there's a second conclusion, which is, in my opinion, just as important as the first. It is important trying to reach the broad public. The second conclusion is important in terms of ourselves, that is, people who are activists in the movement. And that is, the law is clear. Israel is a member state of the United Nations. It has the same rights and obligations as any other member state, and therefore, from the point of view of the law, if you're talking about enforcing the law, that means one, that means two states. Does not mean one state. There's nothing in the law and nothing in the representative institutions that speaks about one state. Now, some of you might feel, well, I don't agree with that. I think it's wrong. And truth be told, probably you can make a very compelling argument saying why it's wrong. But in my opinion, that's not politics. Because politics is not about your opinion or your opinion or your opinion, or my opinion. That's not politics. Politics is about exactly as Gandhi put it. It's where public opinion is at, where you can reach them. And the thing about politics is, if you overreach public opinion, you end up in a cult. So, a concrete example. I told you, if 20 people block that boulevard in front of my house and said we're trying to awaken the conscience of people to give their coats, I would do it. I know it. I know me. But wait. I'm no saint. If they block the boulevard and they said, not to give your coat, but to give a room in your house to the homeless. Well, I'll tell you, I think the person who says that has the moral argument on his or her side. If we want to use the proverbial standard, what would Jesus do? Well, I think Jesus would say, give your room. I do. And I'm not proud to have to say, I won't do it. I'm ready to give my coat. I do have room in my apartment. I can't lie about that. I do. And sometimes I get very torn and twisted inside me. I, I think I... I really should give that room, but I won't. 
And if, you, if the people block the boulevard and demanded the room, they lose the public. Even if, morally, they have the stronger argument. And I think it's the same thing here. You can make a thousand morally compelling arguments why it should be one state. And probably you'd have a lot of right on your side, and you may be able to best me in the argument. But that's not what politics is about. Politics is about where public opinion is at. And if we don't want to lapse into a cult, and more importantly, if we want to take advantage exploit that political opportunity that's opened up for us, we have to be very careful about gauging our goal to reach public opinion, but not to so overreach it that we miss the opportunity. Now, in the time that remains, as most of you know, because this is not a cross-section audience, this is people who I suspect have something personally invested in the conflict, either as activists or as people from the Middle East or as Jews. Um, the two main obstacles that are typically raised to the two-state settlement is the question of how do you reconcile it with what international opinion also calls for, a just resolution of the refugee question. And I have to make a mental note to introduce Muin to Susan. Do you know each other? Yeah, because Susan has probably written more from a legal point of view on the question than anybody around anymore, I, I think. Um, and the second issue is, has the two-state settlement been rendered obsolete by the Israeli settlements in the occupied territories? And what I uh, suggested to Muin is, exactly as in the book, he's going to address the refugee question, and I will address the settlements question. And uh, if I can just say in a personal note, uh, sometimes the book didn't look like it was going to happen, as is often the case with books. And some people said, okay, so Norman, you'll just write the whole thing. I said, no, I, mean, I can't write the whole thing, because I don't think I have the moral authority to speak on the refugee question. Politics should be rational, strictly rational and objective, but honest people will say personal moral issues enter the picture and Muin is the son of, uh, of um, the catastrophe that beset the Palestinians in 1948. And I said either he writes on that topic or the book ain't going to happen. Now, I haven't heard what he has to say in that subject, and I suspect there is an intellectual and a political side to it, but Knowing Muin as I do, and I know part of his family lives in Gaza, because I stayed with them once on a visit, when, as Muin said, there was a time where you actually could travel back and forth, forth between the West Bank and Gaza. So I know that he has the weight, the emotional weight, of his family history, uh, be it his father or his in-laws, uh, when he addresses the question. And so I am as, uh, I don't want to say eager, I am as uh, anxious to hear what he has to say as you do. So let's hear what he has to say. Uh, thank you. I don't pretend to bring any moral authority um, to bear on this question. And I also have never been, uh, just to get this out of the way, I've never been particularly enthusiastic about identity politics. Um, 
I, I'd like to make a few remarks about the refugee question and, and the two-state settlement, just um, based on, on my own um, interest and involvement in the matter. I think it's important to first take a step back and recall um, the origins of, of the Palestinian refugee question. On um, November 29th, 1947, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, which was in a very different uh, General Assembly and did not yet include uh, Palau or Micronesia, uh, or I think over 100 of the other states that would subsequently join it, um, adopted a resolution recommending the partition of Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and um, uh, an Arab state. This resolution, as you know, was immediately and emphatically rejected, not only um, by the Arab population of Palestine, but indeed by the entire Arab world, um, for what were and remain, I think, entirely um, uh, justifiable region, uh, reasons, which is that the General Assembly presumed to give sovereignty um, over 50% uh, of Palestine um, to uh, the Jewish immigrant population, which had in its vast majority um, uh, settled there during uh, the previous uh, decades under basically uh, British rule, and um, controlled only 7% of the land of mandatory Palestine and formed more or less only 50% um, of the population of that portion of Palestine which was allotted by the General Assembly uh, to a Jewish state. I think it's also important to note that when the General Assembly um, recommended the establishment of a Jewish state in part of mandatory Palestine. It never intended uh, um, uh, to in any way authorize the ethnic cleansing um, of that portion of, uh, of uh, Palestine. Yet what we saw was the immediate beginning of conflict, first a civil conflict um, uh, within mandatory Palestine until the 15th of May 1948 um, uh, between the two communities and then after uh, the State of Israel was proclaimed in, on the 15th of May an interstate conflict between um, the new, newly established state and the surrounding ones. Uh, during, that, during that conflict 90% of the Arab population of those parts of Palestine which became the State of Israel were essentially ethnically cleansed um, uh, from, from their territory, from their homes, from their villages, and so on. 90% of, not the 50% of uh, Palestine that was allotted to the Jewish state, but rather the 78% of Palestine um, that became uh, Israel. And I think the key issue to understand about the refugee question is it's not so much a question of whether people um, uh, fled as a precaution, were expelled or fled in terror. The key issue here is that at the conclusion of the war, none of these refugees, in many cases people not yet realizing that they were refugees, were permitted to return to their homes. And already in December of 1948, the General Assembly adopted a further resolution, 194, according to which Palestinians were um, uh, provided the right of return. I, the exact wording of the resolution is something along the lines of all Palestine refugees uh, wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be allowed to do so and should be compensated also for damages and loss of property and so on. Um, that was in 1948. 
what we've had over subsequent decades is now a situation where the majority of Palestinians today, uh, including the majority of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and something between 30 and 40 percent of Palestinians in the West Bank, and including a very sizable proportion of Palestinians who were Israeli citizens, are in fact dispossessed, uprooted refugees. Now, how does one go about addressing this issue? And more importantly, how does one go about addressing this issue in the context of a two-state settlement? Well, there is a view that there is, at some level, a fundamental contradiction between the right of return and a two-state settlement. Um, my view is that the key to unlocking this supposed contradiction and that the key to the resolution of the Palestine, Palestinian refugee question lies in an explicit and unambiguous recognition of the right of return of dispossessed and uprooted Palestinian refugees and descendants. In other words, I feel that it's my view that if this right is not recognized, this issue can and will never be resolved. And I'd also like to point out that when we deal, when we speak of a two-state solution um, on the 67 borders, it's often forgotten that, that the core of this conflict, and in my view, the most vexing issue, if you will, one that, one that is um, more emotive and more existential than the issue of settlements, than the issue even of Jerusalem, is the issue of, uh, is the Palestinian refugee question. And we've had a variety of formulas over the years. For example, the Geneva Accords of, um, uh, this was an informal peace negotiation held between a variety of Israelis and Palestinians about 10 years ago and came up with this formula. Um, and the conclusion of which was that, you know, Palestinians will not have the right of return, and I, I can't remember the exact wording, and, and Israel will not recognize it, but this will be seen as, as the implementation of 194. It's something akin to an agreement in uh, 1995 reached between uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the current Palestinian president, and uh, a, a liberal Israeli politician, Yossi Balin, where they resolved the question of Jerusalem by basically saying that the future Palestinian state would be given sovereignty over a village on the outskirts of Jerusalem named Abu Dis, but that it would be renamed Al-Quds, which is the Arabic name for Jerusalem, and that thereby the Palestinian capital would be in, in Jerusalem, and that would resolve the question of Jerusalem. Well, I think the key issue to understand is that you can't resolve the Palestinian refugee question with smoke and mirrors. Um, the core of any resolution has to be an explicit Israeli recognition of the right of return and of its direct responsibility for causing and perpetuating the Palestinian refugee question. Once that's been done, then I think a negotiated resolution of this question becomes possible, including one that the vast majority of Palestinians, including Palestinian refugees, would be prepared to accept as a just resolution of the refugee question. Absent an explicit Israeli recognition of responsibility and of Palestinian rights, I simply don't see how um, that could be achieved. Now, if, you, if we get into uh, specifics of what will this look like on the ground, I think it's easier to determine what won't work than to determine what will work. For example, um, there was a proposal um, at some point during a, the brief period in which Israelis and, and Palestinians um, uh, sought to negotiate the so-called permanent status issues in which 
um, it was said that uh, the right of return would be subject to Israeli sovereign discretion and that only um, Palestinians who physically resided um, in their home villages prior to 1948, presumably without their, um, their direct descendants and families, would be allowed with very restricted criteria and so on. That's not going to work. Perhaps a formula in which um, all Palestinians still alive who resided um, uh, within what is now Israel, including any of, of their descendants who would like to return, um, that might possibly be something um, that many, perhaps most Palestinians would be prepared to accept. There is another issue here, um, which is the question of, of compensation. And here I would like to just make one brief point, which is that I do not think that refugee rights can be purchased um, with financial compensation, particularly if any fund that is established uh, to compensate Palestinian refugees is an international fund led by um, the US or, or, or the EU or the World Bank or whatever. I think the party that is directly responsible for, uh, for Palestinian dispossession and for having perpetuated um, uh, the Palestinian refugee question over the past 60 years has to be a leading and direct participant in any compensation scheme. Now, if Israel were to get money from the Americans or Europeans or whatever, that's a different question. But the idea that somehow a Palestinian refugee would be compensated by Denmark uh, rather than by um, Israel is something that, in my view, simply uh, won't fly. So unfortunately, I, I do not have um, uh, very clear ideas or, or very uh, specific ideas on what a resolution would look like. I do have very clear ideas on what a resolution will not look like, about what won't work. It does, however, remain my conviction um, uh, that a explicit recognition of the right of Palestinian refugees, an explicit recognition of Israeli uh, responsibility will make a negotiated resolution, in other words, a resolution that is acceptable to both parties and most importantly acceptable um, to the vast majority of Palestinians, including Palestinian refugees, that that will then become possible. Thank you. That was such a careful answer. <laughs> I was listening to every word and um, I don't know, you, you heard it also and then you'll have to decide for yourselves uh, where you stand on it. I will be curious to hear <laughs> what Susan has to say. I hope Mawin won't join me as an enemy of the people. Um, but we'll get to that. I know because Jamil approached me that although I can't see the clock, we're probably reaching the end of our allotted time. Where are we at? Okay, I'm going to take, and you can count the clock, I'll take 10 minutes to do the settlements and then questions from you. Uh, the basic issue with the settlements is very straightforward. Let me just, give me one half second. Um, the basic issue with the settlements is very straightforward. There are 500,000 Palestinian, excuse me, 500,000 uh, Jewish settlers living in the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, that's a significant number. And there is the question whether, as the expression have it, has it, facts have been created on the ground and they can't be reversed. And even if you think the two-state settlement is theoretically the right goal to set for the movement, it's been rendered obsolete by the facts on the ground, or as it said, de facto 
There is one state there. So let me just review quickly the facts, because I don't think the facts accurately represent what the situation is. Number one, I think many of you in the audience will be surprised to learn that physically, physically, the settlements comprise less than 1% of the West Bank, what's called the built-up areas. The built-up areas, the settlements, they comprise less than 1% of the West Bank. Now, some of you are thinking, that doesn't sound right, because they look like they comprise a lot more. But that's not so much an optical illusion as it is a political illusion. So what do I mean by that? If we take this woman here, if I can ask you, just hold your hand up high. Let's pretend she's settlement A. And this woman here, can you raise your hand? She's settlement B. And the gentleman back there, who I think is Jack Trumpor, for just argument's sake, you will be lunatic Jewish settlement C. Now, if these three people raise their hand, you can see they represent about 1% of the room. The problem is Israel wants not just to keep the settlements, but what they call the settlement blocks. And the settlement blocks means from A, point A to point B, and then A and B to C, you connect them, they want the whole area. They want what they call the settlement blocks. And once you try to annex, or once Israel sets its mind on annexing the settlement blocks, there really is no possibility for a Palestinian state. So if I can just have this overhead projector for a moment. Okay, thank you so much. So, if you look at, it's gonna go this way. Yeah, if you look at the map, there's a settlement, it's the blue part. There's a settlement block. I'm gonna just try, just for now, give me half a minute to douse the light. It's in this one. Okay. Which, Good. So, you want to just, yeah, thank you so much. If you look at the blue areas, those are the settlement blocks. The area to the north, it's the settlement block called Ariel Shamron. Sometimes they call it the two fingers. And then there's the block in the middle of Male Adumim, which stretches nearly to Jericho and which separates East Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank. And you might recall, as Muin put it, that there is no East Jerusalem unless it's organically connected with the rest of the West Bank. And there is just no possibility of a Palestinian state with this settlement block. It's not a matter of being stubborn or unreasonable. It's simply, if we can use the language, an objective fact. The area that's called Metropolitan Jerusalem, which stretches from Jerusalem to Ramallah in the north and Bethlehem in the south, it accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of the Palestinian economy. If you don't have East Jerusalem as an organic part of the Palestinian state, there is no economy. There is no state. So, what is to be done? 
The Palestinians, for many years, they negotiated or appeared to negotiate with the Israelis in the question of the settlements. Now, I'll make no brief for the Palestinian negotiators. The lead negotiators were manifestly imbeciles and a disgrace to the people they claim to represent. But we have to also, I think, be fair and give credit where credit is due. There were some members of the Palestinian negotiating team who were very knowledgeable, very reasonable, although not reasonable to the point of acquiescing in a non-state. And they tried in, 19, in, in 2008, they put forth a proposal, the first proposal with a map on the ground. This is what we're proposing. And the map looks something like this. Now, it's an interesting map. As you can see, it's what you might call a clean West Bank. The West Bank is not fragmented, it's not bisected, it's not trisected. It's a, as they call it now, a contiguous area. The little black spots at the border are the areas that the Palestinians said we're willing to let Israel annex in exchange for other territories within Israel. Those areas, they constitute 1.5 percent, excuse me, 1.9 percent of the West Bank. But interestingly enough, if you look at the sidebar, that's where over 300,000 of the Jewish settlers live, or about 63 percent. So the Palestinians put forth a proposal which I would call both principled, they want a real state. As one of the negotiators said to the Israelis during the negotiations, please, don't show me your map. Your map makes me sick. Not because he was being stubborn, but because that map, the one I showed to you a moment ago, it doesn't leave the Palestinians a state. It leaves them, you want to call it an Indian reservation, you want to call it a Bantistan, but you can't call it a state. This leaves the Palestinians, what's their due? But it also tries to be reasonable. Reasonable, you might say, in a remarkable way. It allows 63% of the illegal Jewish settlers to remain in place after a land swap with Israel. Now, it's true, if you can just open the lights now, it's true, it still leaves about 12,000, well, they'll manage it, but while they're doing it, it still leaves about 200,000 Palestinian settlers in place. But even that is a much smaller obstacle than is normally assumed. Number one, surveys have shown, and the surveys vary, but the surveys have shown that about 80 percent, some surveys have shown, about 80 percent of the settlers are what are called quality of life settlers, which is to say they move to the occupied territories because of mortgage subsidies given by the government because of all sorts of material incentives. And they've said 
if Israel is willing to compensate us financially, we're willing to come back. And that just leaves, at the end of the day, it leaves, you might say, several thousand committed, fanatical, if I can use the word, crazy settlers or crazed settlers. But even they are not nearly the problem that's often suggested. So, for example, some of you here, I suppose, some of you here have uh, been to Hebron. Anyone here who was to Hebron, raise your hand. Good. A uh, significant number. And as you know, there is in Hebron a small cluster of settlers, three or four hundred crazy Jews, mostly from Brooklyn or the former Soviet Union. If you see the eyes of the women, they're a cross between the Stepford Wives and invasion of the body snatchers, a very weird collection of people. And they are very determined, or they say they are very determined to stay. So, what is to be done with them? Well, it's really not all that complicated. All the Israeli army has to do is to say to them, listen folks, you're in Hebron. Now Hebron is a very conservative Palestinian city, the most traditional of the Palestinian cities. Heavily Islamic and traditional. Hebronites are not only traditional, they are very stubborn. The joke about the Hebronites is, did you hear about the Hebronite who fell off a six-story building and he lived? Really? How? He fell on his head. They have a very hard head. They're very stubborn, these Hebronites. So all the Israeli army has to do is to say to these 400 Jewish settlers, if you want to stay in Hebron, go ahead and stay. But we, meaning the army, we're leaving. And as one Israeli uh, <coughs> former head of the Mossad the Israeli Internal Intelligence Organization, as he put it, he said, I don't think these Hebronites are nearly as brave as they appear to be. All we have to do is tell them, we're leaving, the, we're leaving you here alone. And he said, you can't imagine how fast they'll come back to Israel. And so it does seem to me reasonable people can find a solution to problems which seem insurmountable on the surface. I listened closely to Muin. He was steadfast on the principle, but open on the question of negotiating a settlement. And if I can say, that was Gandhi's spirit. Gandhi used to say, I am all for compromise, but not when it comes to principles. And I think that's the right way to move ahead. I'm all for compromise, but not when it comes to principles. And principles, I have to stress for all of us, principles is not your principles or my principles. 
It's the principles as they are currently embedded in public opinion and international law. If we stick by them, we can reach a broad public. I am absolutely certain of that. There are a few things I'm certain of, but that I am certain of. We can reach a public on the simple principle, enforce the law. And then the next step, we can find a solution. Muin, and I'm not trying to flatter him, he is not unrepresentative of Palestinians. They are reasonable. You can talk, just negotiate, respect the humanity of the person across the table from you, be decent, be fair. Be decent, be fair. And if Moeen is on one side of the table and there is a reasonable person on the other side, I think the conflict can be resolved. And I certainly want to see that day what Professor Edward Said used to call, quoting a Caribbean poet, that rendezvous of victory. And I'll just end on the note, Professor Said, when he quoted the line, he always talked about quoting the line, there is room for everyone at the rendezvous of victory. I like that, because normally when we think of victory, we think of victor and vanquished, winner and loser. But no, there is room for everyone at the rendezvous of victory. No losers. Just be fair. Be reasonable. And there'll be room for all of us at that rendezvous of victory. Thank you.